Hello and welcome back to this lecture on the dual challenge from artificial intelligence and cognitive science framework for analysis. This is part two um, of this lecture. So if you haven't checked out part one yet, do that first before watching this lecture. My name is Antonia Weitermann. I'm an assistant professor at Maastricht University. Um, and in the first part of this lecture, we have ended on this particular image um, of the analytical framework that the first part developed for situating challenges from artificial intelligence and insights about human cognition to the law. Um, what we did in the first part of the lecture very briefly um, was distinguish between internal and external challenges and then within the internal challenges to look at challenges that are about the application of legal concepts, to look at challenges that address the criteria for application, so our conceptions of legal challenges, uh, of, of legal practices, of legal concepts. And we looked at external challenges to the law, to legal practices, and those can be by challenging um, the presuppositions that law makes, so the assumptions that underlie the law and our legal practices, but they can also be by holding that um, law cannot achieve its own aims, for example. Last but not least, we can distinguish between challenges that are to concepts or practices that we use within legal reasoning, but there can also be challenges um, of or about our reasoning practices as such, so to our legal reasoning as such. Now in this second part of the lecture, I want to predominantly focus on some ways of addressing these different challenges. But to do that, to understand some of these um, sort of ways of addressing the challenges, we first need to understand the distinction between practical and theoretical reason. Very briefly, and there's much more to be said about this, of course, as with all things, um, but very briefly, practical reasoning is concerned with action. Essentially, practical reason is about the question, what ought I do? It can also be in the plural, so what is it that we ought to do um, collectively? Um, but it's very much normative, it's very much concerned with what one ought to do. Theoretical reasoning, on the other hand, is more concerned with facts and the explanation, or concerned with what one ought to believe, so which of the correct beliefs one ought to hold. Um, there are some different, there are slight differences or slight variations in emphasis here. Um, if we take theoretical reasoning to be concerned with facts and their explanation, then it's not normative. Um, if it's concerned with what one ought to believe, then there is a normative component to it. Um, this is not something that we particularly need to worry about for present purposes, however. Um, but we do need the distinction between practical and theoretical reasoning. Because one way of addressing the challenges that are put forth, forth by artificial intelligence and insights from the cognitive sciences is to essentially say that there is no challenge in any way, shape or form, and that there's no inconsistency because insights from the cognitive sciences or facts about artificial intelligence, developments in artificial intelligence, these are, um, not matters of practical reasoning, but rather these belong to the realm of theoretical reason. So there can be no inconsistency, and therefore there can also be no challenge to our practical reasoning practice, to our legal practices, because we're not talking about the same thing. One way um, that we can imagine this um, is if we have two maps that show entirely different areas. So say we have a map of Rome and we have a map of Paris. 
then there can be no inconsistency between those maps because they're not showing the same area. And therefore, we can't say that the map of Rome challenges the map of Paris or vice versa, um, simply because they're not talking about the same thing. Uh, essentially, what we're saying here, if we apply this to, for example, insights about human cognition, is we're saying, yes, but um, law as belonging to practical reason, law as part of practical reason, um, is not concerned with how people actually reason, but how they ought to reason, um, how they ought to act, not how they actually act. So any insights about how they actually act belong to a different realm. They're essentially in Rome, whereas law is in Paris, if we go back to the idea of maps for a moment. A different way of approaching the challenge of looking at the relationship between insights from the cognitive sciences, developments from artificial intelligence, and our legal practices or our legal reasoning practices would be to say, um, sure, um, we are talking about the same thing, but that doesn't mean that those things need to be consistent. Um, if we return to the idea of maps for a moment, we would essentially be saying, well, on the one hand, we have a map of the railroads, and on the other hand, we have a map of the waterways. Um, and these two maps um, are of the same area, but they're taking very different perspectives on that area. Um, so if they don't show the same thing, that's not a problem because they don't need to show the same thing because they're showing us different perspectives on something. Um, if we apply that to uh, legal reasoning practices or rather to um, some of our legal practices, let's take the example of responsibility for a moment. Then one way um, would be to say, uh, sure, um, maybe, the scientific or cognitive scientific image of humankind is that um, it is very unlikely that we have free will in the sense that the law seems to presuppose, but we nonetheless have good reasons um, to keep our existing practices, um, our existing responsibility practices, because this leads to, for example, um, good consequences for our society, because to treat people as not having free will would be to treat them uh, not as agents in their own right. This is a kind of argument that one might see in this connection. Um, so here we don't have a challenge that we need to worry about, because sure, we're both, we're talking about the free will of people in both cases. Um, but the fact that there's an inconsistency between what is put forward by the cognitive sciences and what is put forward by law, what is presupposed by law, um, that is not a problem for us. We accept um, that there is inconsistency, but we don't think that that's a problem. But if we do think, um, that law and the cognitive sciences, law um, and artificial intelligence are to some extent talking about the same thing. Um, so we're not looking at different areas entirely, um, insights about human cognition and presuppositions that the law makes about human cognitions, uh, human cognition are about the same thing. Um, in both cases, we're talking about um, how human beings reason, for example. Um, and if we do think that there should be consistency between the scientific image that we have um, of ourselves, between what we are learning about ourselves um, from the cognitive sciences, or we do think that the law should um, have something to say about what ought to be done with artificial intelligence, 
um, then there may be a genuine challenge coming from these different areas to the law. And this may be something that we need to address. If that is the case, I think there are two ways in which this can be done. Um, on the one hand, we can address the challenge in an ad hoc fashion. And I see that, unfortunately, um, my PowerPoint does not look as pretty as it did on my own screen um, with regards to fitting text in boxes. But I hope you will forgive me for that. Um, so if we take that there is a real challenge that we need to address, then there are two different ways we can go about this. On the one hand, we could say, okay, in each case in which there seems to be a challenge, um, we try to change the law in such a way as to address that challenge. If you think back to the example um, initially of the um, adolescent criminal law in the Netherlands, this is essentially um, what happened there, I would argue. So essentially, we had insights from neurosciences and developmental psychology that challenged um, whether or not someone um, with an adolescent brain, someone who might have just turned 18, um, is equally capable of controlling their own actions, for example, as someone with a fully developed brain. Um, and this particular challenge was then addressed. A different way of going about it, but I think an actually much more um, challenging way of going about it, and one that may not actually be possible, but nonetheless, I think is very interesting to consider, is to approach this in a systemic fashion. Say, OK, um, rather than looking at this individual challenge, let's look at it more broadly. What are some of the presuppositions that law makes in general? Um, so rather than just look at, OK, here we have insights about adolescent brains and their development. Um, what do the cognitive sciences say about, for example, um, the likelihood of free will? And is that not something that the law presupposes? How does that relate to questions of how we deal with artificial intelligence? So to try and develop a systematic and encompassing theory of what the presuppositions are that the law makes, what the implications are of the law, what our individual concepts and their criteria for applicability are, within the law, within legal reasoning, and then to see whether we can ensure um, that all of it is addressed in a systematic and consistent manner. Given that cognitive science continues uh, to develop, that artificial intelligence continues to develop, um, this may be um, too demanding for what we can actually do. Um, but at the same time, I personally um, appreciate this approach very much because I think it will also ensure a more consistency within the law and within our legal reasoning practices. So all of this combined leads us to the following two pictures. On the one hand, we now have a framework, a possible framework for situating different challenges or different possible challenges from the cognitive sciences or from um, artificial intelligence to our legal reasoning practices or to our legal practices. Um, so that each time we come across, be it a newspaper article, be it an academic piece of writing, um, we can ask ourselves, yes, but what is it that this actually challenges? Or what kind of challenge is it actually? Um, and that may clarify some things for us. So this is one thing um, that we have developed in this lecture. Once we have an understanding of what kind of challenge it is we are talking about, we can then ask ourselves, well, is it 
actually a challenge and what kind of address does it need? So what kind of response does it need? Um, and we might say that there is no challenge or inconsistency whatsoever because the insights do not actually concern the same thing that the law is talking about. Or we might say, yes, it is talking about the same thing that the law is talking about. So the insight is concerned with something that the law is also concerned about. But that doesn't mean we need to change anything in our legal reasoning practice or in our legal practice, because we have good reasons for our practice, for keeping our practice the way that it is right now. Um, so that we don't have consistency between what we found um, from cognitive science, from the insights from cognitive science, but that is not an issue for us. So there's still no real challenge. But we might also say that no, um, there should be consistency between the cognitive sciences and between the law, between the image of who we are as human beings, or what the law's agents are, or how reasoning occurs within the law, and insights from the cognitive sciences about um, agency, about responsibility, or about reasoning. And if we find that there is such a challenge, um, then we can wonder whether it is a challenge that we want to, or that can be, or needs to be addressed individually or whether it is one that um, we need to develop a coherent theory for um, that addresses the challenge in an encompassing way. I want to leave you with just some suggestions for further reading. Um, and I hope that the analytical framework developed in this lecture, as well as some of the possible pathways um, for addressing or how other people have responded to these challenges is helpful as you go through other lectures um, of this lecture series and as you go through um, the rest of your career and your life in whatever way, shape or form that takes place. Thank you very much for listening.